a very warm welcome. You're joining us tonight at Hyde Park. Now, with the recent uh, uh, maritime disaster of uh, feeder vessel MV Express Pearl, which led to uh, a perpetual, uh, which looks to be a perpetual uh, catastrophe, environmental catastrophe, questions of Sri Lanka's preparedness to handle a situation as this and uh, the, the laws which strengthen Sri Lanka's claims for compensation uh, are, are ongoing. These questions are continuing to be raised. I thought of inviting to our studios tonight to discuss this ongoing, uh, uh, the ongoing investigations as well as the disaster and its implications with the, um, an expert in maritime law and law of the sea, Dr. Dan Malika Gunasekara. A very warm welcome. You're joining us here at Hyde Park tonight. Thank you very much and good evening. Good evening, um, a German scholar, um, the former executive director of the Ceylon Shipping Corporation. You read for your PhD in Germany and yes. uh, masters uh, in, Netherlands. In, in the Netherlands. Um, I think uh, you've been talking a lot about maritime law, um, how we need to strengthen these laws. But before we go there, I'd like to ask you uh, what, what, what the implications are at present. Uh, because we understand as we talk about uh, the Marine Pollution Prevention Act number 35 of 2008, Sri Lanka cannot um, seek compensation. Uh, we cannot go anything more than 15, um, 15 million uh, dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Uh, not really, because if you look at the present uh, legal instrument that we have, like mm -hmm. you very correctly mentioned, the Marine Pollution Prevention Act, under which there is no limitation regime that is intact there, mm -hmm. because they, there is huge misunderstanding mm -hmm. among uh, many, uh, in, I know, including the government authorities, that we do have a maximum cap of liability, what we call the limitation of liability. Okay. This is something that even the present legislation has, you know, misdirectly inserted in the uh, Parine Pollution Prevention Act. Because what the limitation cap there is, the limitation of liability, is pertaining to the Convention on Civil Liability for Oil Pollution Damage 1992, mm -hmm. or what we uh, abbreviately refer to as the CLC 92. But in this particular scenario, there is no application of the CLC 92 to this. Why is that? Because unlike the, the incident of MV New Diamond, mm -hmm. MV New Diamond was a super tanker. Mm -hmm. It carried oil, it carried crude oil as cargo. But for vessels that carry crude oil as cargo, CLC 92 apply. Mm -hmm. But not, for, not with regard to other ships. Okay. Now, what we should have like, you know, implemented is taking the International Convention on uh, Hazardous and Noxious Substances of 1996, as well as the Bunker Oil Convention 2001. Mm -hmm. We are not a party to any of these conventions. Mm -hmm. And we have not included these conventions or the conventional provisions or even the provisions of our national law into our Marine Pollution Prevention Act. Mm -hmm. like, for, uh, like, however, the bunker area is addressed. To some extent, the chemical areas are also uh, inserted in the uh, uh, Marine Pollution Prevention Act, but not fully, you know. We need to revise this law. Mm -hmm. We need to amend this law and bring in the proper legislation to place. So in, in order to directly answer your question, mm -hmm. There is no limitation as such. But but we are of the understanding here in Sri Lanka that there may be a limitation of up to this amount. Is is that right? Just just to be uh, just to clarify all this before we proceed. The entire confusion arises mm -hmm. with in relation to this insurance policy. You know when a ship uh, goes into water. Uh, of when a ship starts its voyage, generally the ship must maintain the insurance policies. Right. And in a ship, there are many insurances policies, mm -hmm. insurance policies. Like right? now, pollution damage is one area where the ship has to maintain uh, pollution damage uh, by bunker oil, one certificate of insurance for that. Then there is a HNS insurance cover 
for hazardous and noxious substances, one insurance cover. Uh, then likewise, certain other pollution damages, if any, there are certain other covers that the PNI or the Protection and Indemnity Clubs mm -hmm. cover in the ship. Mm -hmm. So now the, the, the misunderstanding here is that uh, they are trying to interpret these insurance laws or insurance policies in this particular scenario to say that we, this is the maximum that we can have. Mm -hmm. It is the maximum that the insurance has covered. Right. That is the confusion here. Mm -hmm. But according to the uh, Marine Pollution Prevention Act, we can claim all our uh, real pollution damage and preventive measures taken, the costs and the damages. So together. according to the Marine Pollution Act number 35 of 2008, we can, uh, we can seek compensation for all these damages apart from uh, the insurance that we're talking about. Exactly, because the, these two mechanisms will operate like kind of separately in the present structure of legal instruments in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. On the, the, the hand of, uh, uh, on one hand, the insurance thing, where the insurer, the PNI club, will come forward to uh, uh, provide the compensation uh, as far as what the insurance cover has covered. Right. But there may be some excess cover, uh, some excess compensation or liabilities that may be mounted in mm -hmm. courts in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So for that, we need to like sue the ship owner because the ship owner in the insurance side he will be covered by the PNI, but in other areas he will not he may not be covered by the by the PNI. So mm -hmm. so when we have claims in court. The, the, those two areas can have to be handled separately. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if we ask for one billion dollars, maybe that the insurance cover only half a billion dollar. Mm -hmm. Then, then what about the rest? We need to prove these facts uh, with evidence in the court in order to obtain the proper remedy for the claimants. And that particular uh, thing that is not covered we certainly have to be taken from the ship owner. Right. Uh, when we talk about uh, the present situation and the implications, what's the scope that we can, uh, we can actually uh, claim through the ship owner? What should we consider uh, as, as an expert in this area? What do you suggest? Actually, if you look at the, uh, the, the, poly the, the amount of pollution damage has been caused to uh, our country mm -hmm. as, a, as a whole, we do have claims, number one, to the marine environment. Mm -hmm. The marine environment consists of uh, the flora and fauna in the, the sea, right? The living, non-living resources at sea. And then uh, marine environment extends not only to the, mara, the, the sea and the seabed and the other resources at sea, but also to the other coastal mm -hmm. uh, beaches and then who may be dependent mm -hmm. on the uh, sea resources, like for example, the fish fishermen, one side, then the hoteliers on the other side. And then the, uh, there may be other claimants like uh, uh, the dwellers and whoever who uses the sea for recreational activities now with this particular scenario they cannot use the uh, sea or the beaches uh, here so there are plenty of um, plenty of claimants that may have claims in the uh, in, in in the in the present uh, uh, situation now when you claim uh, against the ship owner you need to be very specific of your uh, claim mm -hmm. of your damage or the loss because I know that now there may be idea of uh, people even whether they can take compensation in this case like imposing the liability against the owner and obtain compensation now that is not granted really in court because you have to be very direct right some physical damage and uh, also uh, indirect damages that may uh, be allowed according to our law in Sri Lanka. Now we know that pure economic losses are not entertained by our law because we are uh, English legal tradition country and pure economic damages are not awarded in such a situation. So when it comes to economic damage, you know, in 
in the, the international legal structure what they have, especially in the case of the CLC 92 that I mentioned mm -hmm. previously, they have what you call the fund convention, that whatever the court cannot give, the fund will come forward to award uh, another set of compensation from that. And there are also these PNI clubs, uh, inter-club situations where they also will contribute towards the damage. And even then, even more would be like the clubs of the uh, shipping community or like, like, the, like the ship owners community. But Sri Lanka uh, is not party to this convention or, or no, not No, here ratified, what happens it? is that since we are not a party to the HNS convention uh -huh, uh -huh. and also we are not, we have not brought in these provisions to the, our national law, we will have problems in obtaining such, uh, uh, such funding from those funds. We will only be able to get from the ship owner and also from the PNI. So how do we, how do we at this juncture work to enable that all other uh, avenues are open to us in terms of claiming uh, damages to to all aspects of life here? That's a very good question, uh, Indivari. Actually, what we have to do right now, number one, is we need to get our claims assessed properly. Mm -hmm. We need to, uh, mm, the country must uh, uh, invite the general public who are affected by this. We know that fishermen are uh, very much uh, affected by this present scenario. They cannot go for fishing and so forth. So we need to call for their claims respectively. In my opinion, we need to uh, publish uh, some uh, notices, uh, public notices and call for their own uh, grievances and what sort of compensation that they would like to have. Then we have to create the layers. What are the, like the first layer, tier one, tier two, tier three, like that, you know? What are the potential claims that we could entertain? Mm -hmm. This is a, actually an exercise that the government has to do, not the private sector. Private sector can come up with their claims, but the government has to do this laying out of the tiers and thereafter see how we could proceed in obtaining the compensation from the responsibles or what we call the polluters in this uh, scenario. We have this uh, polluter pays principle under which that the polluter is strictly liable for such a thing. Now I understand, I saw uh, some uh, news item yesterday that uh, uh, the government is intending to uh, uh, have some uh, uh, international law firm to work with uh, these uh, things. So it's a very good uh, 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 move that we have to have some good claims entertained here. That is very important. I had been advocating the idea not to go for an interim claim or a small claim at the beginning like we did in the MV New okay. Diamond because we are going to have it then. We need to have a very proper claim. Like I told you, the tears and so forth. These are the things like, you know, I have been taught, I have been researching in back in Germany, back in Europe, you know, but how to do this. But are we doing anything wrong? Are we doing anything wrong uh, at present? Uh, I don't think that we are doing anything wrong with the, the claims procedure. Mm -hmm. We have to follow the proper claims procedure. Mm -hmm. We did wrong, we did do uh, some uh, mistakes in the uh, uh, New Diamond incident. So we right. should not do the same. Repeat, That's repeat what I have been advocating. Right, all this time. Uh, we'll take a short commercial break here at Hyde Park to stay with us. Welcome back. We're in conversation with maritime law expert Dr. Dan Malika Gunasekara at Hyde Park tonight. Um, of course, the CEO of uh, the feeder apologized to the people of Sri Lanka uh, for, for any uh, damages caused. And investigations are ongoing to ascertain whether there has been any omission, wrongdoing uh, from the side of the crew. But as these continue, um, let's talk a little about Sri Lanka's preparedness to handle a situation as this. Um, yes, this incident has, it's in the past now. Investigations are ongoing. Uh, the, the damages will continue to uh, hit Sri Lanka. But going forward, we're talking about being a maritime hub. We're talking about uh, attracting more and more vessels to the country. But the law of the sea, you're an expert in this. How strong are we here? Now, actually speaking, 
Uh, you know that, uh, as you mentioned, the CEO of the shipowning company has unconditionally apologized mm -hmm. to the people of Sri Lanka. So that uh, uh, that shows that there is a way that we can reduce liability on the shipowning company, mm -hmm. right? And also on the fact that what the crew has done wrong here is that bringing uh, an unseaworthy ship okay. to our most pristine waters in this country right because you are not supposed to bring an unseaworthy ship to sri lanka our problem is that we do not have penalties in when uh, such uh, uh, unseaworthiness unseaworthy ship is brought into this country this is what i had been telling all this time you know our legal system our legal instruments are not strong enough to address uh, these kinds of situations so this is something that is very important for the preparedness that you are asking me mm -hmm. right the preparedness now just leave out the legal preparedness uh, for a moment. Uh, if you look at the technical preparedness, okay. we do have what we call the National Oil Spill Contingency Plan, NOSCO. Now, if you compare with other countries, especially the states uh, that border to highly dense uh, shipping uh, lanes, like Sri Lanka is one of the highly dense uh, shipping lanes. We know everybody is telling that talking now that we are bordering the southern uh, sea route of the Indian Ocean where, where that carries uh, over two-thirds of oil, uh, oil trade like the tankers and half of the containers uh, in, the, in, the, in the world container fleet are going uh, through this, uh, this channel. Right now here, this path, now here what we have to do is take out the experiences of such other countries that border such high density lanes in the world. And if you look at those countries, what I have researched and I have done is that they have brought not only the oil spill uh, contingency plans, but also with regard to chemical uh, spills, with regard to uh, uh, radioactive uh, materials, with regard to uh, other areas. Okay. Like, uh, so they, they are much more prepared in terms of whatever the circumstance that may occur at any moment but here i'm not i'm not going to like you know put the ball pass the ball on the mipa because mipa has to act according to their uh, present legislation within their powers that have been given so within their powers they have done the nosco NOSCOP and I was also uh, an advisor to them at that time when they created this NOS NOSCOP. So we, we, we conducted trainings, everything okay. for, in order to bring this, but NOSCOP is uh, NOSCOP alone is not sufficient here. We need to have other types of contingency plans for chemicals, for radioactive materials, for other other various things by taking international examples. It's very easy. We don't have to reinvent things. You know, we don't have to invent by ourselves. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of experiences that we can take out from the world and implement in this country. So in that way, we were not prepared. As a small island nation looking to develop, looking to go um, regional, uh, attract more and more um, uh, ships to the country, um, you're talking about uh, technical aspects that we need to move forward with. We need to uh, bring together uh, in order to ensure that our preparedness is well, um, well formulated ahead of any catastrophe. But um, I'd like to go back to the legal aspects also. You say we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to you know, com come up with new um, provisions. But follow what's happening, uh, what other nations have um, implemented. But as a small island nation, especially when we consider the power play, the interest of uh, bigger nations, powerful nations in the country, and new developments, investments coming into the country, how do we ensure this? What specific laws and legal provisions do we bring in? Now, you would like to call our Kalamu port as the maritime hub mm -hmm. of uh, the in South Indian Ocean, right? Everybody likes to call our uh, Kalamu port as the maritime hub. But the question is, we are not yet a maritime hub. We are just a transshipment hub. We need to have everything in place in order to call ourselves a maritime hub. Now, for example, Singapore is a maritime hub. Right? We need to not only bring the business, not only the technical capabilities, but we have to have a very sound legal system 
pertaining to maritime laws and law of the sea. We need to bring in these international legislations into being. Our biggest hurdle is that we are a commonwealth state, so we have to follow the commonwealth tra legal tradition that international law have to be brought through our parliament the supreme uh, legal uh, supreme legislature you know we have to bring in these legal uh, uh, international legal instruments through our law our, our parliament and then make acts of parliament in sri lanka so that it's a it's a dual system we have to bring it so that you know, we would be more legally capable of handling. There are so much of international regulations, especially I'm concerning about the, the maritime sector, that we are not a party yet, like the ones I mentioned. Then there are other areas like, for example, the Ballast Water Convention, the Anti-Fouling Convention. We are not a party to this. So if we face such catastrophes stemming out of those areas, or substances, we, are, we will be in much danger. So how can we say that our marine environment is very secure? We cannot say that because we are not prepared technically in that case. We are not prepared legally in that case. Okay. So we need to bring in these laws into place. And I have been telling the authorities, national authorities for, oh, I think, like 10 years, do this because otherwise we are in this danger. We are facing a huge danger. So we should not make Sri Lanka the Sri Lanka's maritime waters, the maritime litter in the world. Uh, something I want to go back to is you mentioned uh, about economic damages, pure economic damages, that Sri Lankan law does not entertain um, such claims. But if we are to do this, in this case, how do we move about that? Now, what has to happen has happened. Mm. So we can't now remedy uh, outside the prevailing law mm. that we have. Mm. So within our legal structure, now we have to battle it out. So, and uh, the present legal structure is not that competent to handle this sort of a scenario. We have to accept that. So we need to look forward, we need to reform. But answering your question, what I would like to say is that the pure economic losses, now what are the pure economic losses? Like, for example, the expectant loss. Now, for example, let me clarify, uh, if a hotel wants to have compensation and the hotel say that because of the, uh, the damage that has caused to the coastal area, the, the beach, right? Our tourist uh, arrival for the next three years will not come. And therefore, we are losing this much of a profit from the business. Now that one is a pure economic loss. And also if they say like, you know, we were, we were expecting to have uh, this much of a travel uh, dense uh, volume, but uh, because of this incident, we couldn't do. That's, that's a pure economic loss. If the fishermen say we were to have a much bigger uh, profit in the next coming three years, but because of this situation, we couldn't do it. Right? So it's not a net income loss. It's a kind of a profit loss, which is a pure economic loss. In the, the English law, uh, there is no provision that uh, these, for these kinds of things, that the pure economic losses could be uh, uh, given or granted by the court. So and that is why you suggest that uh, the, the public and, and uh, the, the area residents also be consulted. Is exactly. That? Yeah, this is why. That's why I, 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 I proposed previously to uh, make it, uh, uh, to, to, to take this to the attention of the public and call for their uh, proposals of what they have lost, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, create the tears mm -hmm. in uh, doing so and then ask for the compensation. Now, I mentioned that the government uh, uh, is expecting to, like, uh, intending to invite a foreign legal uh, firm to do this. So this is what even they would do. Because I know I have first-hand you know, experience in this. This is what they will do. They will do the cl claim assessment process uh, legally. We'll take a short break. We'll, we'll return to speak more at Hyde Park. Um, I think uh, we're talking about what measures we need to take going forward, but also talking about the immediate uh, conversations and uh, debate that arose uh, with, with this disaster um, on uh, 
uh, in May. Uh, the, the vessel arrived in Sri Lanka on the 19th and then uh, we're talking about this catastrophe. But uh, this question of an email exchange between the ship's local agent and the captain, which had uh, apparently been deleted, this is what he said. If it is proven true, what are the implications here? Now, let me explain uh, uh, in Divari the, the uh, uh, importance of an agent mm -hmm. uh, in the shipping business. Generally, when a ship reports or, or calls on a, on a port, it is mandatory that the ship has a local agent. Mm -hmm. Even in our law, it's the same. So uh, for any casual caller, uh, they normal what they do is they casually appoint an agent. But in this particular case, this ship or uh, ship owning company has a permanent agent in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. So it's, the per it's actually the agent that is responsible to the uh, port. Mm -hmm. Agent is responsible for the port. He has to take all measures when uh, a ship of his principal, right? Here in this case, the principal is in Singapore, mm -hmm. uh, Singaporean company. So when such a ship is coming, the ship owner has to take all the measures to let the ship in and do all the cargo loading, unloading, or whatever, even the uh, attending to the to a leak like this, uh, chemical leak, whatever. So. Mm -hmm. They have to uh, they have to coordinate with our authorities and do so. Mm -hmm. Now the general procedure is that when a captain needs such a uh, attention or some captain needs such a assistance, he normally uh, writes to the agent so that the agent can coordinate with our port and get this organized for the for the ship to go and attend to the leak and so forth. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, if the ship owner has deleted such emails, if that means that is to prevent uh, any wrongdoing on the part of the agent, mm -hmm. that uh, he uh, he he would want to, uh, you know, that may be the the reason that he has uh, deleted the uh, the emails. I but I don't know. I'm, what I'm telling this is, what is it that said, yes. yeah, this is what it said. Mm. So in that case, of course, the agent is liable. Agent is liable under the under the laws of Sri Lanka. So d does that mean we can take action against any uh, any parties or anybody responsible for this uh, disaster? On, of Ac course, of course, he he can be criminally prosecuted. Uh, there may be provisions to even in the civil action for compensation to be joined because of this uh, to to strengthen the case much more, right? But also, when it comes to uh, criminal uh, liability, uh, they are, uh, he's, he's criminally liable. But we have to again see what are the legal provisions that are there in such a situation. You know, in this particular environmental damage area, mm -hmm. our criminal law is quite vague. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that we need to develop in order to. Uh, uh, bring into effect, like I told you, the seaworthiness factor. Right. If a ship is unseaworthy, we should have laws to 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 punish whoever who brought that ship. Mm -hmm. Right? It could be the crew, it could be somebody else, whoever you know, uh, like negotiated or coordinated in this. Mm -hmm. Now I know that uh, even uh, like last year or one and a half years ago, there was a very uh, similar situation occurred in Mauritius called the Vacasio uh, ship. In that case, the, the, the Vacasio case, the seamen working the crew, they brought the ship close to the, uh, the, 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 the coast in order to get the reception of mobile facility. Mm -hmm. And in that, in, by doing that, they went on ground. Mm -hmm. And thereafter, there was a pollution damage. Then they arrested the crew members. And even now they are in the, 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 the detention centers because what they have done is what you call the breach of innocent passage as per their law. Okay. Now we do not have such strong laws to uh, bring the culprits okay. un, uh, responsible under our uh, prevailing criminal law because we need to have, okay, Un, un, uh, to punish laws with regard to unseaworthiness of the vessel, then punish laws when an innocent passage is breached here, mm -hmm. because innocent passage is when you come to the Sri Lanka's territorial waters and you do not uh, 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 comply with the uh, United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, uh, particular area on innocent passage. Mm -hmm. So when there's a breach of passage, innocent passage, you're liable. Uh, talking about the seaworthiness of MV uh, Express Pearl, uh, is it is it the leak? Because we understand the harbour master had said that such leaks are normal. Such leaks are normal, but you know, 
at the time when the ship uh, uh, left the port of Hazira mm -hmm. in India, mm -hmm. they knew already there was a leak. A prudent captain, what he should have done is call his salver, right? And then the salver could attend to that and salver could take it to what you call a place of refuge mm -hmm. in the sea or port of refuge, right? And then coordinate that matters and uh, safely bring to Sri Lanka a seaworthy ship. So when what, what we call a seaworthy, unseaworthy is that when if the ship was unseaworthy at the time of commencement of the voyage, that means now the last port was India, they are commencing from there to Sri Lanka. At that moment there was a leak. So then the ship is not seaworthy legally. Mm -hmm. But what the ship uh, master could have done, he could have asked the salvers to attend to this and take the ship to a, what we call a place of refuge and then attend to the leak and then slowly bring it to Sri Lanka. That's from the, uh, the, the side of the crew or the captain of the ship. But from the Sri Lankan side, uh, do you see that there has been any negligence or uh, ignorance in, of, of any party in allowing the, the vessel into Sri Lankan waters? Now, what our authority says that they did not know about this leak when it was uh, allowed for anchoring at sea. So therefore, our authorities say, uh, we are not liable, we, do not, we did not know mm -hmm. that this ship was unseaworthy at that time, mm -hmm. right? So that is what they say. But since now the VDR is with the CID, the CID can check all sorts of communications that have been communicated always, uh, or, 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 I mean, between all the, the people, like from the ship to the agent, from the ship to the ship owner, from the ship to the uh, port, so all the communications can be detected and analyzed. So I think it is too early for, for me to comment on mm -hmm. those things because these right. investigations are with the CID. Uh, going forward now, is it is it a court case that uh, once investigations are over, what, what's the procedure going forward? Uh, criminally, yes, there mm -hmm. will be a court case mm -hmm. uh, uh, to criminally prosecute who are responsible. Uh, whoever responsible for this, uh, based on the CID's finding, they, the Attorney General Department will prosecute, because at the moment the Attorney General's Department is only um, uh, uh, presenting the facts uh, to the court, mm -hmm. so they have to uh, criminally prosecute uh, with the proper uh, particular um, sections, penal sections that are there available in our law. Is that is that what's best for Sri Lanka? Yes, okay. at the moment. Not not an out of court settlement. Out of court settlement will come in the in the in the in the area of com obtaining compensation. 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 Mm -hmm. Civil. That's what I said. Mm -hmm. That out of court is very likely where the uh, PNI club, the insurer, comes forward to settle. Uh, the claim, right. but uh, but what I believe is that there will be more claims mm -hmm. than that. Uh, I, I, we have we have just a few minutes on the program, but going forward, as 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 a small island nation, as I said earlier, uh, we have a lot of areas to strengthen our laws. In there, there was a lot of controversy uh, centering the port city even years ago about uh, uh, environmental aspects, how how what what sort of implications we have to uh, the mainland, but. Beyond this, you spoke about certain legal provisions, certain mm, strengthening uh, areas that we needs to be strengthened. But what do we have to talk about when we uh, talk about these, uh, uh, about China, India, the United States? All these countries are very much interested in um, Sri Lanka, our strategic locations, and uh, as we are geographically uh, positioned in strategic uh, strategically, uh, in terms of maritime importance and moving ahead as a nation. What, what do you think needs to be done? Actually, in the very, uh, we do not have a national maritime policy in this country. You know? We are, as I mentioned to you before, we are, try, we are, we are boasting that we are a maritime uh, hub. But we do not have a national maritime policy. If you look at Singapore, for example, they do have a national maritime policy. Their maritime administration is pretty much developed. That is why they are growing every day. You know, we, we, cannot, we cannot just make another Singapore in Sri Lanka by just by looking. We have to have these implementations. We have to implement these things. We have to take measures. We do not have a national maritime policy. What sort of things that need to be done? What sort of things need to be done with regard to the other countries that, you know, we are coming with investment opportunities, with investment policy? We should not 
deny these things. We should not reject these things. These investments are very much important. Whether it is US, whether it's China, India, we have to have a policy in place. Right? Now, we did a national maritime policy, I think in around 2016 or 17, if I'm not mistaken. I was the moderator of the national maritime policy, but uh, it was headed by the Ports Authority. And uh, there were all the stakeholders that were involved in this national maritime and logistics policy. We did a wonderful job. We had uh, some about six committees there, led by some maritime experts in this country, multinational, uh, the, some owners of the multinational companies, Sri Lankans, who were there, right? Uh, headed this uh, marit uh, National Maritime uh, and Logistics Policy Committees. We did a wonderful document, but unfortunately, this has not yet been passed by the cabinet. So unless we have a proper national maritime policy, you know, everyone will do whatever they want. Um, governments after governments talk about massive developments, um, investments, mega cities, but as you say, uh, a maritime policy is what we need going forward. I wish uh, we have more time to speak on these subjects, but that's all the time we have at Hyde Park tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Is there anything you want no, to... No, thank you very much, Indiori, for inviting me. <laughs> I thought you had uh, some uh, remarks to end with, but... Thank you again. Um, I, I really enjoyed this discussion. We had with us Dr. Dan Malika Gunasekara, um, expert in maritime law and law of the sea, a former executive director of the Ceylon Shipping Corporation. Uh, he's also a German scholar. He also studied uh, in the Netherlands and he um, shared his views tonight on uh, the ongoing uh, investigation and um, disaster, environmental disaster and implications on Sri Lanka after the um, MV Express Pearl um, disaster. Thank you for joining us at Hyde Park.